Hello and welcome to the continuation of our lectionary studies as we look at the readings from the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Um, as we take a look at our Old Testament reading today, we jump into one of the, uh, what's called the 12 minor prophets or the, the lesser prophets. And it's not that the message was any lesser, it's just they're called minor prophets because they weren't as big in terms of what they had written and, um, as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Daniel usually is lumped in with the big prophets, even though within the Hebrew text, he's um, listed as, you know, in, in a different section rather than the prophets. He's listed in um, a section called the writings. But as we take a look at this, Amos is one of these interesting writers um, who um, wrote during the, and his, his ministry was during the, the 8th century BC. So 755 to 760 is usually the dates that are associated with his preaching. And he came, um, this was a time in the Old Testament where, um, you know, David established the kingdom of Israel, and then after David's time, it fractured into two. So you had the northern kingdom, Israel, uh, which retained the name of Israel, sometimes called the northern kingdom, sometimes called the kingdom of Samaria. And then down south, you had Benjamin, Benjamin and Judah sort of hung together in the south, um, where that contained the city of Jerusalem as well. And what we know from Amos, and we find out here in this particular reading, is he came from the south, from Judah, but he was sent up to preach in the northern kingdom, and it got him into a little bit of trouble along the way, and eventually, um, you know, based on the the, the apocryphal histories, as, uh, you know, as far as we know, um, basically where it talks about the lives of the, the Old Testament prophets, um, he was put to death um, probably by one of the, um, the the son of one of the priests in the northern kingdom. Um, you know that that's that's one of those maybe ifs uh, sorts sorts of things along the way. But um, what we do know is is that as Amos was preaching, basically he was preaching the end of that northern kingdom, which happened sometime around seven hundred and twenty. And so if you're counting backwards, because you're counting down to zero, uh, roughly, which was considered the time when Christ was born, he was probably born um, a couple of years before or after, uh, based on based on calculations now. But um, so he's preaching 755 to 760, and roughly 40, 45 years later, um, yeah, he and basically Israel is is destroyed and and the, the prophecies come true but as we dig into this old testament book and sometimes these are really interesting ones fascinating ones for us to dig into um they're they're not as big um or, or as, as much to consume as the large prophets but they they contain their own um their their own message um often overlapping with the other prophets but um, they're, they're good for us to digest as well. So let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we um, come with humility, recognizing that oftentimes we don't dig into these portions of scriptures the way that we ought to. We also come before you with, um, with the prayer that you would open our ears to hear your word so that rather than simply building upon our assumptions about what is there in Scripture, that we would truly learn to listen and listen as your Spirit spoke through these, these writers in the Old Testament as well. Grant us that those open ears so that through these writings we would learn to see also your hand at work within the world as we see it here today. All this we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, before jumping in, just very briefly, with the Old Testament prophets, um, the Old Testament prophets really are, are during, uh, they, they, from Isaiah all the way to the end to, to Malachi, um, they, they were sent out to be these preachers of God's word during a time where um, both the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah basically had, had um, you know, fallen back on their laurels very much in the same way in which our modern world um, has done, where where we think we know what religion is about or what Christianity is about, but really we don't have we, we don't take the time to actually dig in to see what it is that God has said and spoken and instructed. So that, you know, even when we do do that, we usually do it in a way within our society here. Um, you go to universities, you go to many denominations, and 
and, and you dig into it, not in order to be serious about the text, but in order to say that's, well, that part of the text isn't relevant and that part doesn't apply and this part doesn't apply so that we come and dream up our own ideas about what um, we think God wants from us rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us through the word. And um, because of that, um, you had a number of things that started running into, you know, immorality. You had um, immorality both relating to sexuality, both relating to um, self-styled forms of worship that started to creep in in place of, you know, truly hearing from the Lord what worship is. You had um, any number of things from, you know, the political life, um, redefining the social life of, of, the, of the community to um, injustice running rampant because of socioeconomic means. Sounds familiar, I know it does. Um, but all of these things were certainly there. And, and when you read through these minor prophets, you discover that the good Lord wasn't pleased with it. it, it it's not... Um, it's not a reflection of God's um, desire for humanity, even though, um, you know, when when people wander away, and this is part of the part of the Old Testament history, is is that um, at a certain point in time, he says, if that's the direction you want to go, then I'll simply step back and let it fall apart, and. Um, you know, and as we take a look at our world, even here today. Um, that becomes one of those those things that reading through the prophets um, really helps us to to wrestle with, um, and, and you know, and I say that in 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 a way where I really encourage us all to wrestle with it because um, when when society turns its back on God and His Word, um, basically. You know, all the troubles that we see are really nothing more than our own creations. Um, and and as we listen to that, um, you know, just as in the Old Testament, where you had the false prophets and you had the, the kings and the various different nations who thought they were so pious doing everything that they were supposed to do, and really they were just chasing their own ideas. Um, you know, as we listen to all of that, it's a good reminder and reflection to us before we even start criticizing those in authority over us to take a look at our own hearts and see what it is that we're doing so that, um, you know, as the Lord lets things fall apart in the Old Testament, he allows that even within our own day and age in order to have us um, discover the limits of, of our own impiety, which really is what it amounts to, our own arrogance about what we think, you know, we think God wants from us rather than taking the time to humbly listen. And then to, to you know, um, face our own, you know, destruction as, as, you know, the things that we build out of our world um, just further all of the problems of, you know, um, crushing people and not, not um, living in that gift of grace and love the way Christ defines it by his death on the cross sacrificial love. Um, as we hear those sorts of things, you know, Old Amos, Old Testament reading, and, and this is the other side of it, um, ties beautifully with the gospel reading from last Sunday where John the Baptist, who was sent to preach God's word to make straight the way of the Lord, which was very much also part of Amos's preaching to, to uh, preach both that hope that comes from God's promise, which ultimately is fulfilled in Christ, but then also the judgment on the, the foolishness of, of um, the culture and the society of the day. Um, John the Baptist did the same kind of a thing, got in hot water with King Herod, particularly um, with, with his, his brother's wife, who um, decided that, you know, this was a great opportunity to get his daughter to, or to, to get her daughter, who pleased Herod, and so by her dancing and all of these things, to, to request um, for John the Baptist's head on a platter. And even though Herod feared God, um, you know, he didn't want to be embarrassed um, in front of all the crowds. And even that is a kind of one of these reflections, how peer pressure can drive us um, into all kinds of vice in our day and age. Um, not just today. It happens all over the place. So looking at Amos, and this is one of these fascinating passages, 
um, this is what the Lord God showed to me. And so Amos apparently um, saw visions um, and then was given the ability to interpret these visions. So this is what the Lord God showed to me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. Okay. Now, nowadays, um, you know, growing up, younger generations don't necessarily know what a plumb line is. Older generations certainly do. Um, what's a plumb line? Basically, a plumb line is is a string with a weight at the bottom, and you hold it up and and suspend it in order to have a vertical vertical line, um, which is truly vertical from the ground. And even though the ground might be crooked, you still get a straight up line off of the off of the plumb line. And you use that in order to test um, not only construction to see how straight and how how well squared off it is, so that you don't build something crooked, but then also in order to um, make sure that when you build, you build it up to snuff so that you're building straight up and down. Now here, this plumb line in the Lord's hand as he's standing beside the wall, well, the wall is Israel, and he's trying to check and see how straight is Israel or have they started to go crooked. You know, this is the image that's coming through. And what's, what's the plumb line? Ultimately, it's God's word. But, you know, as you take a look at it, the good Lord is testing it. And here's the fun part, because Israel after they separated from Judah, they liked the idea of worshiping the Lord because that's what people had done, but they didn't like the idea of having to send people down into this foreign country, Judah now, in order to worship in Jerusalem, where, you know, Jerusalem is part of that, and that's where the temple of the Lord is. And so what the kings very early on of Israel did is they built their own temples up in Samaria and Bethel. Okay, and that, those, the name Bethel comes in here. And it was at that place that they built um, basically a kind of a temple which was um, a reflection of the temple in Jerusalem, but at the same time they just kind of switched things around in terms of the worship enough so that it was different enough so that people would say this is, and this is all part of the background for the New Testament as well where, you know, Jesus and the woman at the well, um, and the Samaritan woman at the well, and she says, well, you know, our, our forefathers worshipped here, and you guys, the Jews, say that you worship in Jerusalem, and all of these kinds of things, where Christ does something totally different. But here, the Lord is testing the nation of Israel, and he shows this to Amos. And he's using this whole picture, this image of the Lord standing there, not just carpenter, but the Lord maker of all things, the maker of heaven and earth, standing there with this plumb line to check the wall. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And then the Lord said, okay, and here's the words from the Lord, which not only he had the image, but then he has these words. Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. So God hasn't rejected the northern kingdom here as he's talking about it, but he's hanging this plumb line in the midst of this, this nation of Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. Okay, we have a judgment saying, you know, I'm hanging this plumb line and they're not measuring up, so I'm not coming this way again. And all of the sanctuaries, Bethel, and then the cities of worship that were established in the far north, they're going to be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam, the current king, with the sword. Okay. So here's the word of prophecy. God is going to abandon Israel to its own devices. And basically he's turning against Jeroboam and he's actually turning... Um, and he's basically going to allow um, Jeroboam's family line to, to be destroyed, which happens, like I said, 40 years, roughly 40 years-ish, 40, 45 years after the prophecy, or at least after it was you know, believed to have been written down. So here, then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, so here's the priest from the sanctuary up in Bethel, he sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, so... Amos is going around preaching this message of judgment and that the good Lord is measuring the people of Israel and that he's going to destroy the high places and that basically that the Lord is against Jeroboam and his house and he's going to cut him down. So Amaziah, 
the priest from, from Bethel, the sanctuary there, sent to the king, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel, and the land is not able to bear all his words. Okay, so basically he's going on and he says, listen, I've heard what Amos is saying and it's getting around and he's going around and people are talking about it and people are not happy with what they're hearing. Basically trying to set up saying, you know, you might want to deal with this Amos character. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel must go into exile away from this land. Now, that's not what you want to hear as both a king, a monarch, saying that your, your reign is going to come to an end and your family line, in terms of uh, family line sitting on that throne, will come to an end. But more than that, your nation's going to be taken away from you. So all the people are basically going to be sent into exile. The Lord's going to send them all around, scatter them around the normal world. But that's the message that Amos was given. So Amaziah said to Amos, here Amaziah comes and he finds Amos and he says, O seer, that's one of the terms that's used for, for a, um, someone who, who's considered to be a prophet or at least claims to be a prophet, a seer particularly, one who sees visions. So Amaziah says to him, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there. Okay, since Amos is known to have come from the south, he says, go back home. You know, don't bother us with this kind of thing. Go back home, <coughs> earn your bread there. Okay, but never again prophesy at Bethel. So don't come up to the sanctuary up here in, in Israel because, you know, you're from Judah. You guys worship down in Jerusalem. Go tell them what you have to say. Don't bother us with it. Trouble is, is the Lord sent him from Judah up to Israel. So for, and then he goes on and says, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. So notice whose sanctuary? It doesn't even say the Lord's sanctuary at this point. It's the king's sanctuary. Yeah. And this is the place, <clears throat> this is the temple of the kingdom. Now this is one of those ultimate images of um, church and state being wed together in this odd kind of a way. And that's always been a source of trouble, both in the Old Testament and certainly in our own day and age. And it's both this warning that, you know, um, you know, true religion from Scripture is not simply to be something that, that um, beefs up um, the, the local um, state culture and state ideologies. And churches... Um, and we need to watch ourselves in this because this is a very serious thing. We need to be very careful that we don't simply start preaching whatever is popular from the state or what the state wants us to preach so that we're just patting them. Um, we're not here to preach popular culture. And also, you know, and, and, and see here, here's the problem with the plumb line. If we're not lined up to snuff, sometimes we try to lean too far the other side. Um, and, and we, we overcompensate, but then we miss the center of God's word by saying, well, if, if we're not supposed to preach culture, okay, and you get groups that say, yeah, 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 culture is going to hell in a handbasket. Well, if that's where we build, um, yes, basically, because culture is always a broken reflection of our humanity. So if we're preaching that, we got a problem. But then you get groups which will overcompensate and they'll fight against it as though they're more, they're more righteous. When here's the problem from Scripture. Um, no one of us is righteous. No, not even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, you find that in the Old Testament prophets and from Solomon as well, where it's this reflection that, that we're born um, broken. And coming to terms with that is so hard because, and especially now in, in our day and age where, um, you know, we either want to pretend we're not broken and say, no, no, that's just me and you've got to deal with it, or, uh, or, or hide the brokenness, or if we do admit the brokenness, we admit the brokenness, but then say, but it really doesn't matter. Well, you know, learning to befriend the brokenness is part of that call of repentance. Not to say that, you know, you befriend it and then keep building on it. Um, there's a problem there, right? 
Um, just like when you build a building, um, think about Florida right now, where the, the ground underneath started to cave away and all of these sorts of things. And then, the, you know, that condo part of it fell and now they've had to destroy the rest of it. Look at what it did. Not only the building, but all the people that died within that. You know, when we look at our lives and say, befriend our brokenness in the sense, yeah, okay, but I'm just going to keep doing it. Um, that's sinning all the more that grace can abound, that Paul says, Romans chapter 6, absolutely not. That's just a total abuse of God's word, God's work, God's gospel, you know, all of these kinds of things. Well, here, as we listen to all of this again, you know, this whole sense of the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom, okay, um, the church has always been, and we need to acknowledge this, um, has, has always needed to be um, the one that critiques society, even when society doesn't want to hear it. You know, Herod didn't want to hear it. Herod's brother's wife, who he took as his own in the New Testament, didn't want to hear it. And here, Jeroboam, Amaziah, and the whole nation of Israel didn't want to hear it. And as we listen to all of that, it's, it's that real challenge for us so that, um, not that we all of a sudden take it upon ourselves saying, I'm so much better than you, so now you better listen to me because I'm the righteous one. But instead that we learn to hear it ourselves, especially during a time of um, calamity, as we see the world, um, you know, going through all of these weird changes, society going through all these weird changes, people digging themselves in in order to fight rather than coming together in order to support one another. And even though you find glimpses of it over there, ultimately the true reconciliation between people and people, no matter what skin color, what ethnicity, what language, happens in and through that sacrificial work of Christ which then God gives us through his word, through baptism, through the working of the Holy Spirit, so it becomes alive in us too. Um, that sacrificial element means um, dying to our old broken self too, our culturally formed um, self. Not that we ever step out of our cultures, um, but that we learn to recognize that our cultures are never perfect, that there is much part of the problem of the brokenness of humanity, and that we learn to take a step back from that and rest in Christ. Okay, so going on, <clears throat> the king's sanctuary, and it's the temple of the kingdom, and so Amaziah tells Amos, go back to your homeland, don't want to hear it, okay, earn your living there. And then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, and here is the prophets and preachers' burden, um, and, and basically he pulls us out. I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son. So in other words, it's not my family trade. And I wasn't trained in one of these schools of the prophets and so on. Okay, But I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. So in other words, I grew up on the hills in the back country where I had a herd to take care of. And then, you know, we had figs as well that we grew. So, so in other words, Amos probably wasn't very well educated in a broad sense, even though he had a lot of um, practical smarts. But then verse 15, But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, and there's a fascinating phrase there, following the flock. So in other words, you know, the Lord called me from just following the sheep. Okay, And, and you know, the way we talk about sheeple today, you know, people that are just following the crowd and all those sorts of things. You know, there's probably an element of that in there. So the Lord took me from just following where people are going. And he said, okay, said to me, go and prophesy to my people Israel. There's both that word of judgment there, but also this wonderful word of gospel that is attached to it. Because even in the midst of their brokenness and their cultural apostasy, in other words, culturally stepping away and wandering away from the word of the Lord, and from the Lord himself as a result. <clears throat> Even in the way in which they were so full of themselves, thinking that they had the world by the tail, 
he still calls them my people, my people Israel, as he's preparing to send them off into exile. And those words um, both are a challenge for us, but then also a great comfort for us, because even as our own society becomes more and more antagonistic towards, you know, biblical Christians, um, not the ones that react and swing too far the other side, but the ones that stand on law and gospel so that we get hit by all sides of people saying, well, how come you're not following society? Or how come you're not fighting against it in the way that everybody is? No, um, you know, we, we learn to stand in the middle at the center to be guarded, formed, and shaped by Christ and his word. Um, God still calls us his people, even though, you know, it may very well be that our society here in the West falls apart based on, and I'm talking about not Western Canada, but, you know, what we call as Western civilization. You know, U.S., Canada, um, European cultures, Western European cultures, may very well be that they fall apart along the way because of, you know, the stubbornness of people's hearts so that we, we shut down you know, the Holy Spirit working by closing our ears to his word and saying, we know better. Um, as we hear that, not only Amos speaking to the people of Israel, but the Lord speaking to us today through these words, it's a reminder, um, don't take the word of the Lord for granted. Don't take your Christianity for granted. Um, don't take the gift which God provides us in Christ and in baptism for granted, but instead allow the Holy Spirit to um, draw you closer and closer to him, give you that spirit of curiosity in order to um, immerse yourself more and more within the gift that God has given so that we can find ourselves not only, you know, dancing around the edges of it, um, with, with just a little bit of a whiff of what it might be about, but actually learn to immerse ourselves within that gift, within that, that pool of baptism. Because, well, the way Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman who asked, well, you're, you know, the Jews say worship in Jerusalem, and our people, the Samaritans, say we worship here. You know, and Jesus' answer is, is tell you the truth, uh, the time is coming, it is now here where we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, where Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, where it's in Christ that we find that, that anchor, that presence of God, that place of worship, as we hear and grow and are formed in that and learn that through, through that close reading, that deep reflection on you know, that mystery of God which is revealed to us, the way Paul writes in the Ephesians lesson from Sunday, in Christ, in baptism, in him. All right, the Lord be with you and uh, keep you safe. Stay cool. I know it's another hot week, but at the same time, you know, the Lord bless and keep you always in that, in, in that, that wondrous gift of his son, his word, as we come to see him and know him through the scriptures.